One of my absolute favorite things about the community we've built here at Big Dogs Gotta Eat, y'all always let me know what the fuck I got wrong in the comments section, which is beautiful. Because obviously the majority of you guys are big football fans, right? You're in the 95th percentile. If you're watching redraft fantasy football stuff in March, you are an elite football fan. Elite football fans only in this audience. So when I touch on players, especially around this time when I'm talking about coaching changes, I'm talking about rookies and prospects coming into the NFL, there are a lot of you guys that went to school with some of these prospects and you got to watch them live over and over again, or you're fans of the teams. Obviously, I'm not a fan of all 32 teams, so I'm not watching every single play and game of every single team, but some of y'all are. So you always let me know the ins and outs of guys that maybe I missed some things on. So this is a super deep dive into into the NFL coaching changes, head coaches, offensive coordinators, possibly some O-line talk if it's going to affect fantasy football. And this is arguably going to be one of the most important videos that you guys watch or listen to all summer. Because as I said in my top 10 lessons learned video a few weeks back, two, three, four, I don't know how many weeks back it was. Coaching is so fucking important when it comes to fantasy football, man. People need to stop using that piece of analysis as like a secondary piece, and it needs to be the primary. I would almost say coaching is like the single most important thing when factoring in players' outlook for the next season, because you have to know what kind of scheme they're using, pace they're going to be in, pass to run ratio they're going to be looking at. And at the end of the day, these coaches dictate how much opportunity a player gets. A player can have all the talent in the world, but if their coach wants to use a running back by committee, no matter what, it's going to be a problem. And the impact that it's going to have on the players on those relative teams for the 2020 NFL and fantasy football season. And the reason I preface with that is because I'm going to bring up some coaches. I did a ton of research for this video today, so there's a good chance I get some shit wrong, but I know y'all will let me know in the comment section. So please do. If you have some kind of personal attachment to some of these coaches or their schemes or whatever the fuck is going on, drop it in the comment section below. That would be much appreciated. So again, we are looking at all NFL coaching changes, head coach, offensive coordinators that took place this offseason, how it's going to impact 2020 fantasy football. It's Thursday. Stop yelling. Tuck your shirts in. Let's eat. Before we kick off the video, I want to read off an iTunes podcast rating. We're two away from 300 ratings, people. From J.H. Doe. I've been watching Nick Snacks and Animal deliver the big facts for the last couple of years, usually commenting first on as many videos as I can. I, I know exactly who you are because I always comment the goat emoji back. Their content is second to none. You can tell how hard Nick works to deliver the best content and constantly offers new ways to provide the viewers information. I love when Dr. Jesse Morse comes on the show to break down injuries. Nick has collaborations with other experts in the industry and the business of fantasy football episodes. Most recently, I'm really enjoying the new series of Bunk Bed Breakdowns with Mike and Noah, which is what inspired my bandana today. I've been playing fantasy football for seven years, and this will be my third year doing Dynasty. Big Dogs is my number one source for fantasy and Dynasty content. Even though it's the offseason, BDGE never sleeps and continues to provide the viewers with the best content possible. BDGE even has a draft guide on their website with tons of research, rankings, articles, and more on how to dominate your leagues. They show the stats, deliver the facts. Highly recommend BDGE to anyone looking to gain a competitive, competitive, we're just going to do the Shakira tongue shake there advantage in their leaks hashtag bdge hashtag bunk bed breakdowns hashtag zero hashtag zendaya i love that you ended it with zendaya so thank you to jh dog remember to leave a rating and review on itunes if you are trying to get featured on next week's episode all right let's buckle up because this is about to get crazy we're gonna do this in alphabetical order with the carolina panthers they hired matt rule as their head coach, who was the former Baylor head coach. They hired Joe Brady as their offense coordinator, former LSU wide receivers coach and passing game coordinator. Rule is 44 years old, just got a seven-year 62 milli from Carolina. So the boy is eaten. A quick background on Rule, he worked his way up to become the Temple head coach from 2013 to 2016, eventually got hired by Baylor in 2016, flipped the program around. 1-11 and their first year, 7-6 and their second year, 11-3 and their final year, including the Sugar Bowl appearance. You could just see the difference that this dude made at the program. When I look at him, he's like a program builder. He is a, a leader, right? He's a guy that players are going to absolutely love, and he's going to be able to take charge of the team and dictate the culture of the team. He's one of those guys. Now, he did not call plays at Baylor, and this is going to be a common theme throughout this episode. I think that is a great thing. I like when the head coach is not necessarily the guy running the offense and running the defense so they can focus on leading their team and getting all their players' heads right and getting people in the right position to succeed. So he did not call plays at Baylor, which does not mean that he's clueless on the offensive side of the ball, though. He has coached quarterbacks. He has coached the offensive line. He has coached tight ends. He has served as an offensive coordinator before. So the guy knows the offensive side of the ball. So it's going to be interesting to see how they divvy up the play call. I would 
would love to see them give Joe Brady the reins on this one. Joe Brady is 30 fucking years old. He is three years older than I am, which is out of control because I'm going to be way more successful than he is in three years. So the fact that he's only an offensive coordinator right now is actually kind of embarrassing to him. No, but on the real, he is the youngest coordinator in the NFL. I think this is a fantastic hire for this Carolina Panthers offense. He won the Broyles Award this year for the best assistant coach in NCAA. Quick history, he was an offensive assistant for the Saints in 2017 and 2018. 2019, he joins the LSU to be the passing game coordinator and wide receivers coach. And we knew how that shit went. Joe Burrow wins the Heisman, those for a light 60 touchdown passes. His wide receivers were fucking nothing short of incredible. We had Jamar Chase, the Blitnikoff winner, going 84 for 17, 80, 20 touchdowns. Justin Jefferson, who just blew up the combine, 111 receptions, 15, 40, and 18. You had a sophomore wideout, Terrence Marshall. While those guys were doing it, he also put up 13 touchdowns. So with coaches and coordinators, you always have to ask yourself, is it chicken or the egg? Did they play well because he was awesome? Or did he reap the benefits and praise of them being awesome? But if you look at LSU in 2018, they were super run heavy. They did not have anywhere near this passing success success that they had in 2019. So when you look at the common denominator, which is Joe Brady, seems like a good place to start. So what kind of play calling might we expect? Well, this is a quote from Roster Watch that we got of Matt Rule. It says, he needs to put your elite players in position to be elite. Don't envision cutting back on Christian McCaffrey's usage, but says the team could be more multiple using some other running backs on the roster while C-Mac is also on the field. That first first, first statement is really important here. Put your elite players in position to be elite. There are a lot of coaches in the NFL that do it the reverse, where they take their scheme and they just try to mash players into their scheme to make it work. When you have coaches that can adapt to the players that are on their roster, you see much more successful offenses. So in terms of Matt Rule as like a play caller and what we can expect from the offense, he's very aggressive. He's a big go for it on fourth down guy, which all of Twitter and analytics Twitter loves. Baylor's offense deployed 10 personnel, one running back, zero tight end, four wide receivers or 11 personnel which is one running back one tight end three wide receivers between 85 to 90 percent of their snaps and this is an article that I will link down below in terms of the way that the Baylor offense ran we could expect a lot of spread we could expect expect a lot of wide receiver running diverse route trees and stuff which is great for DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel he has shown a lot of different packages and RPO plays were a big part of Baylor's offense and this is going to be great for a healthy Cam Newton assuming that Cam Newton is a starting quarterback for the Panthers if you look at what the starting quarterback for the Baylor offense did over the last two years Charlie Brewer he had 280 rushing attempts over the last two years 719 yards and 18 touchdowns they were a big Big QB sneak, guys. So I love everything about this offense for Cam Newton. One thing that's notable is just how much he spreads the ball around, though. One of the notable quotes from his presentation, at, I don't know if it was at the Combine or whatever it was from, but good offenses have 8 to 10 players touch the ball every game. He said rather than having a running back with 200 yards, he'd rather split that. 100 from the running back, 50 from the quarterback, 50 from the wide receiver. So he's going to be looking to get a lot of players involved on this offense. So I'm, I'm really intrigued to see what they do through this draft process. They want to use more two running backs on the field. So do they draft a, a pass catching running back? Do they draft a heavy guy where they could use C-Mac more in the slot, running more routes and wheel routes and shit like that, more screen plays while they have a thumper like maybe like A.J. Dillon or something in the backfield? Do they draft another wide receiver? Because right now they have D.J. Moore, who is fantastic, and then they have Curtis Samuel, who everyone is just like, oh, he had so many unrealized air yards. So that means he has to be amazing. We don't really know if Curtis Samuel's fucking good, guys. So I love this. I love this change for the Carolina offense. Bring Matt Rule on, bring Joe Brady on, two offensive guys. I think it's going to be fantastic for DJ Moore, assuming Cam Newton's at quarterback. With Curtis Samuel, again, man, we don't have much to go on. Like, he wasn't good last year, and we could all say how many times he was targeted downfield, but it's not like he was that good on those targets either. I understand a lot of them were uncatchable. When you look at the catchable targets, he was just average, middle of the pack. If you're not going to continue to feed him that type of volume, then he's probably not going to be that great of a fantasy asset, at least not one that's going to be that consistent. If they do go out and draft a wide receiver in day one or day two, if they draft a pass catching running back, if they draft another pass catching tight end or something like that, that's going to be a problem for Curtis Samuel. It ain't going to eat away from DJ Moore's targets. It's not going to eat away from Christian McCaffrey's targets. Curtis Samuel seems to be the next guy in lines. I'm way more worried about Curtis Samuel than most people in the industry are. So I love this hire for Cam Newton, assuming he is under center. I think we're going to see a lot of RPOs. We're going to see the ball spread around a lot, and we're going to see a lot of explosive plays down the field. Let's move on to Chicago, where they sign Bill Lazier as the offensive coordinator. He was the former OC of Cincinnati. They also bring on John DeFilippo as the quarterback backs coach. A lot of people were excited about the team entering 2019, and that was for a few reasons. Like, you look at their defensive dominance the year prior. That's not something that is necessarily sustainable year over year. Like, we've, people have done the work and the analytics behind it to prove that elite defensive performances from a team standpoint are just something that you're not going to get year over year. My personal opinion on it, or the reason I think that is, is because 
when you look at like offensive things are much easier to predict year over year in terms of success because quarterbacks are the most valuable piece of any football team by far right so if you have the same quarterback year over year you pretty much know what you're going to get from an offensive output yes the rankings of different like passing yardage and rushing yardage or whatever might swing a little bit but overall you know what your offense is going to be because the quarterback is what dictates the success of an offense but on the defense yes you might have one or two big playmakers but none of them affect every single play like a quarterback does so when you have an elite standout performance on the defensive side of the ball from a team standpoint you're going to have trouble repeating that year over year because one player does not dictate how a defense plays that combined with the fact that their offense got very lucky in 2018 when we actually dive into the numbers pretty easy segue into why they underperformed in 2019 like you look at their offense under mark helfrich they were 22nd in yards but ninth in points so they scored way more than what their actual production on the field was which is a case of like serendipity and luck and things breaking the right way some guys not catching interceptable passes when it hits their hands like shit like that so that kind of delta is eventually going to even itself out and that's exactly what we saw in 2019 where they ranked 29th in yards now and also 29th in points per game. So everything kind of evened itself out. I won't go too far into Lazer's offense or the OC because Matt Nagy is the head coach still. And it is his offense, and I'm sure he'll continue to call plays. Now, it's possible he does give up play calling duties. And if that's the case, we will circle bike on this. And as far as we know, there are not a lot of like personnel changes. We'll see what happens through the draft through free agency. If they bring in Andy Dalton, because obviously Andy Dalton and Bill Lazier have a, have a history going back to Cincinnati. So that would be interesting if they brought in Dalton to compete with Mitchell Trubisky. They let go of Taylor Gabriel so I'm intrigued to see what they do behind Allen Robinson and Anthony Miller if they bring in some type of uh, some type of tight end you know looking at Austin Hooper or someone through the draft whatever they have to bring in some other playmaker on the offensive side of the ball for sure I would love to see them bring in some kind of hybrid playmaker like uh, an Antonio Gibson or a Lynn Bowden or something to get a little bit more creative like a almost like a boost on what Taylor Gabriel was their offense something that could spread the field but also take a lot of handoffs and take away some of the carries that Tariq Cohen doesn't deserve and probably David Montgomery doesn't deserve so we'll see again we'll circle back if we find out that Bill Lazor is actually calling the plays. Let's move over to the Cleveland Browns. Now, this is going to be a very interesting topic of conversation throughout the offseason. They hire Kevin Stefanski as the head coach, who was the former offensive coordinator in Minnesota. They hired Alex Van Pelt as the offensive coordinator. He was the former quarterbacks coach of Cincinnati, also a former NFL quarterback, if that means anything to anyone. So Kevin Stefanski, also just 37 years old. I love the direction the NFL is going, where they, they're finally, finally, fucking finally, stopping the ridiculous cycle of just hiring and rehiring and hiring the same fucking guys over and over. A guy has a has an eight-year stint and was terrible as a head coach, and then he just gets hired as a head coach in another in another team. I'm like, what are you doing? What the fuck of the last eight years? Why are you hiring Adam Gase after he just put up a three-year stint with the Dolphins, which was historically terrible? Like, yes, he's actually a really good coach, though. He just, he can't coach a team well, but he's a really good coach. Anyway, Stefanski being 37 is what I'm talking about, right? These young guys, we're seeing Joe Brady, the youngest coordinator, 30 years old. We have Matt Rule is relatively young. We have Stefanski, 37 years old. Stefanski was actually the runner-up to Freddie <coughs> Freddy Kitchens last year. They decided to stay in-house and, and hire Freddie Kitchens from within, but Stefanski was the runner-up for the head coaching job last year. Then he got the job this year. Now, what can we expect from Stefanski's offense? If we look back at when he started calling plays in Minnesota, it goes back to 2018, and most people know about the split. The Vikings offensive coordinator, John DeFilippo, was fired in December. Savansky takes over for like a three-game stretch. He was the interim OC, started calling plays, and the splits were massive. Prior to Stefanski taking over, the team was one of the most pass-heavy teams in the NFL, right? They ranked fourth with 64.4% of their plays being passes. Savansky takes over for the final three weeks of the season. That number dips from 64.4 down to 52%, which was the third lowest rate in the NFL. So they go from fourth highest passing rate to third highest run rate once Stefanski takes over. Obviously, it was an extremely small sample size to go off of, but then he was hired as the full-time OC for the Vikings in 2019. We saw that same trend continue. It was it was an outrageous number when it first started because Kirk Cousins was throwing like 11 passes a game, but that even itself out. But the Vikings threw the ball in just 51.7% of their plays last year, the third lowest rate in the entire NFL. Since Stefanski took over from the Vikings, which is at this point a 20-game sample size, including this year's playoffs, Kirk Cousins has not attempted more than 38 passes in a single game. I'll just say 
say straight out from the get, like we should not expect Baker Mayfield to have a high volume passing a season in 2020, just based off the way that Stefanski runs his offenses. We're not really going to dive into Alex Van Pelt because it's going to be Stefanski's offense. Very run heavy. Now, there are a lot of similarities that we could take away from this Cleveland Browns and Minnesota Vikings offense when you actually look at it in terms of personnel. Now, you have a quarterback who on both teams, by all intents and purposes, very much a competent pocket passer. You have Kirk, you have Baker Mayfield. You have two very skilled wide receivers, Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs, Jarvis Landry, and Odell Beckham, and then you have two featured workhorses in Dalvin Cook, Nick Chubb. So what does this actually mean for Baker? Let's jump into some numbers. Let's jump into the big facts as always. Kirk Cousins last year led the NFL with 13 play action touchdowns and attempted the most passes from under center this season. According to ESPN Stats and Information Research, Mayfield ranked 30th in the NFL in completing just 36% of his passes outside the pocket. Cousins, meanwhile, was 5th, completing 62%. Dating back to when Stefanski took over as Minnesota's offensive coordinator in Week 15 of 2018, Cousins also connected on 16 touchdowns with only one interception off of play action passes for a QBR of 83 over that same span Mayfield's QBR in play action was just 67 so I love this in terms of inefficiency things Stefanski seems like he knows what he's doing in terms of getting his guys in good positions to succeed and be more efficient while the volume might be down a little bit you have to love the idea of a higher percentage of play action passes because that's just a natural thing that opens up the defenses for a lot of offenses and you look at like the top offenses in the league and there's a, an astounding resemblance between the high percentage of play action passes that these teams do and just pre-snap motion and getting the defenses on their heels and this is a key piece of Stefanski's offense so mixing that into Baker Mayfield's game I think is going to be it's going to make him a lot more efficient now in terms of like the wide receivers I like this for Landry he's probably going to be the slot guy very much like we saw Adam Thielen be and then we'll have OBJ as like the Stefan Diggs we saw like Stefanski can be very adaptable when it comes to the pass game although he, he focuses heavily on the run game he's good at switching things up when things come up on the fly and that's one of the biggest traits for a head coach right we see a lot of bad head coaches like Jason Garrett, who we'll get into later, have a very tough time of like adjusting to the game plan on the fly. But Stefanski, you saw last year when Adam Thielen missed a lot of time, Stefan Diggs stepped up and went absolutely nuts, right? And they were able to feature him in the passing game and see a lot of success. So I'm not worried about the wide receivers in this offense. I will preface this by saying if the vo the volume is going to be lower here in this passing offense overall and OBJ, I mean, we just haven't seen him put it together for a few years now. So he's someone that I likely won't be drafting. Even, you know, it, a lot of people are gonna be like, oh, he's such a good value at the back end of the second round. Round. Even like early third round is probably a little bit of a stretch for where I want to be drafting him. And I haven't started on my rankings yet, so I don't know where exactly I'd have him. But I, I, I'd imagine he's probably a mid third round pick for me right now. Yeah, the talent is there or whatever. I think Landry is definitely a very good value in this offense that features their slot wide receivers a lot. Most importantly, let's talk about the running backs, though. I'll hit you with a big fact out the gate. The 2019 Vikings running backs group generated the single most receiving yards on screens among the 32 NFL teams. That is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing for a Nick. Chubb, possibly for a Kareem Hunt. I absolutely love Stefanski coming over for Nick Chubb. He is a run first guy. And we saw how many touches that Dalvin Cook got in this Minnesota Vikings offense last year. I don't expect Chubb to fall off from the number of touches that he got last year. And I feel like Chubb was kind of looked at as a disappointing fantasy pick for people. It's because he, ne he never really had that like ceiling. He ended up with like a very good stat line. He ended up with a really good floor week over week because he got so many touches, but he never really hit that ceiling that you needed from someone that you drafted in the first round or like like very early second round but realistically he was a he was a fantastic runner third most carries so he proved that he could handle an NFL workload second most rushing yards in the NFL probably would have been the king had Henry not popped off for 200 plus yards in the final week of the season or his final game second in evaded tackles per player profiler so he was very efficient on his run first in breakaway runs which is 15 plus yards he's explosive he's elusive he's getting the volume what done happened was the touchdowns man he got really unlucky in the touchdown category still finished with eight rushing touchdowns zero receiving touchdowns though Chubb was basically the single least efficient goal line running back in the NFL last year is it because he's a bad goal line running back no it's just a, again I'll use this word all the time serendipity shout out to Gary V random things happening random unlock so those things are gonna make themselves back into uh, good fortune for Chubb in 2020 but now imagine Chubb being used more in the screen game even if you don't think he's that great of a pass catching back he could do things that are very similar to what like Derrick Henry does and the opportunity that he gets just get him in open space with a head of steam and Nick Chubb is an elite fucking athlete he has the breakaway speed we've seen him pop off for 80 70 60 yard run 
runs in the NFL already. He could do that in the screen game plenty. So you look at what the Minnesota Vikings did in the screen game. Again, they generated the single most yards. And now put Nick Chubb in that offense. Chubb has to be the least talked about 330 touch running back that went for almost 1,800 yards from scrimmage last year. That's not in that elite conversation. I legitimately think that Chubb should be talked about with the number five overall pick. Once you get past Barkley, C-Mac, Dalvin Cook, and Zeke, there's a very real argument to have Chubb there as your RB5. 1,800 yards from scrimmage, 330 touches, guys, with unlucky touchdown rates. I'm not oblivious to the fact that Kareem Hunt is still very much in the backfield. He is a restricted free agent so we're not actually sure what's going to happen with him this offseason and that will most likely determine where Nick Chubb actually goes in fantasy drafts regardless of where Hunt ends up even if it's still in Cleveland I like Chubb as a first round pick because when we look at the numbers in terms of like touches last year Dalvin Cook touched the ball 21.6 times per game Alexander Madison was stealing eight and a half touches per game that's 30 touches between the RB1 and the RB2 last year Chubb actually averaged fewer touches than Cook did he averaged 20 and a half touches per game so if we're looking at it and we're like Chubb's going to get the same amount of touches 20 to 21 per game. Hunt can get 9 to 10 per game. That's the same setup as the uh, as the Vikings offense had last year. That type of number makes sense to me. And if that happens, right, Chubb gets the 20 touches a game. Guess what? He's going to be exactly where he was last year in terms of workload, 320 to 330 touches. Now, more of those touches, just by design, because Stefanski's game, more of those are going to be screens. So he's going to get more involved in the passing game, in my opinion, and have more chances to get himself in a good position to break away on these screen passes. Plus, you look at the unlucky touchdown rate. Again, worst conversion percentage of all NFL running backs on the goal line last year. Year, those eight touchdowns could easily jump up to 12, 13, 14. I love this for Chubb. Unfortunately, if Kareem Hunt goes elsewhere, then so is everybody else. I'm actually very curious because I think this is going to be big. Like if Kareem Hunt stays in Cleveland, what do you guys think about Nick Chubb's fantasy outlook for 2020? Because as you can see, I'm very high on it. There are going to be some changes throughout the offseason that I'm sure will dictate my outlook and my opinion on Nick Chubb's outlook. But I want I want to get a sense for where you guys think he is. Because again, like he was a little bit disappointing last year just because he didn't give you those ceiling games. But I feel like if you look at the way things are lining up for 2020, more screen passes, more lucky touchdown rate. I feel like the ceiling, the ceiling games are going to be there. He showed us he can handle NFL workload. He's ready to come kind of take over. He's that elite athlete that you look for in an upper echelon NFL running back for fantasy, at least. So I'm, I'm curious to see what your guys' opinions on Nick Chubb are. So go drop that in the comment section down below. Make sure you smash that thumbs up while you're down there if you're enjoying the video thus far. So let's move on to another big time coaching change. We have the Dallas Cowboys. They bring in Mikey Analytics McCarthy as the head coach, who was obviously the Green Bay Packers head coach from 06 to 2018. He was out of the NFL last year, taking some much needed hibernation. They kept Kellen Moore on as the offensive coordinator, which is very interesting. The Cowboys staff that they put together is extremely experienced, and that's what they were going for. They have four or five different guys on their staff now that have served as as an NFL head coach. So it's going to be a, an extremely interesting makeup. Now, as a, as a coach, despite how it ended, Mike McCarthy, uh, despite how much like Twitter shits on him, he had a, a very successful stint in Green Bay. There, there's no denying that. Plenty of playoff berths, obviously the Super Bowl win. And now he takes over a very, very talented roster. And this is a tweet from Warren Sharp just talking about Jason Garrett compared to Mike McCarthy. I won't read the entire thing out for you because y'all know how to read. But the basic premise of it was Jason Garrett is fucking terrible with analytics and didn't care about anything that would help him win. Mike McCarthy plans to install a 14-person football technology department with an eight-person analytics team. You have to like that, just from a football standpoint. Now, what I'm most interested to see is what happens with Ezekiel Elliott. Now, in Green Bay, Mike McCarthy with Aaron Rodgers threw the ball like like the running part of his playbook was was eaten by his fucking dog or eaten by him. When we're looking at the rates, passing rate for the last three years in Green Bay, first, seventh, second, red zone passing rate, second, 11th, third, 10 zone passing rate inside the 10, fourth, ninth, second. So they pass the ball at a very high percentage. When they were close to the goal line, they continued to pass the ball and pass the ball and pass the ball. And when I'm looking back historically, the leading ball carriers over the last six years under Mike McCarthy, Aaron Jones, 133 carries, Jamal Williams, 153, Tymont, 77, Lacey, 187, 246, 284. You have to go all the way back to 2008 to find a 300-plus carry running back under Mike McCarthy. That was Ryan Grant. He had 312 carries in 2008. Now, Zeke had that 10-game season in 2017 because of the suspension where he only racked up 240 carries, but that's 24 a game, which would equate to way over 300. In his normal three seasons, he has gone over 300 carries in all of them. So you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. McCarthy has not fed someone over 300 carries. Zeke has really never gone under 300 carries. What do I think? I think Zeke will go well over 300 carries. Zeke is going to eat in this offense 100%, but 
What I'm concerned about with Zeke is what happens in the passing game, because we've seen the target numbers for Zeke really, really get up there, right? He's had 72 and 95 over the last two years. Very important in fantasy football. When you look back at McCarthy's time in Green Bay, in his entire 13-year stint as the head coach, there were only three separate seasons where a running back saw 50 targets. So only three separate times a running back saw 50 targets in a Mike McCarthy offense in Green Bay. Now, Zeke has had over 70 in each of the previous two seasons. So do we see that number dip down for Zeke? And that's what concerns me a little bit. If you look at the last three years under McCarthy, the RB target shares in Green Bay, 17% in 2018, which is 28th in the NFL, 18% in 2017, which is 25th in the NFL, 17% in 2016, 24th in the NFL. You kind of see what the offense was set up to be like in Green Bay, and it was not very running back involved in terms of the passing game, which scares me. Again, I I still think Zeke is definitely going to eat. But what happens with this passing game involvement? Now, the wide receivers and Dak, however, you have to absolutely love this statistically speaking, right? We've had so many huge fantasy seasons from wide receivers under Mike McCarthy, dating all the way back to Donald Driver, Greg Jennings, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb, James Jones, Devontae Adams. Like, it's all there. There was almost always someone that goes off in Green Bay under Mike McCarthy as a fantasy wide receiver. In his 13 years as the Green Bay head coach, they had 10 fantasy wide receiver ones and nine fantasy wide receiver twos. Can Amari eat? Fuck yeah. Can can Michael Gallup also eat? Absolutely. I'm assuming Dak is going to be back. I'm assuming Amari Cooper is going to be back. I highly doubt they let either of those players walk. I love both of them in this offense. An interesting fact from Pro Football Focus, McCarthy's up-tempo offense is very quarterback receiver friendly because it limits defenses from being creative and disguising different looks. According to Pro Football Focus, the Packers used no huddle on 20.7% of their plays from 2014 through 2018 under McCarthy, the third highest rate in the league during that span. With Prescott as their starting quarterback since 2016, the Cowboys have used no huddle on just 9% of their plays. So expect the more up-tempo offense expect Dak to have a better pace expect there to be more plays more passes etc 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 and this is great to pair with Kellen Moore who apparently is not only being kept in Dallas under Mike McCarthy after his very first successful year there we saw Dak put up career numbers across the board under Kellen Moore but he will continue calling the plays as per Mike McCarthy himself which is huge because last year the Cowboys were extremely up-tempo their pace was very 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 fast under Kellen Moore second in overall seconds per play and first in neutral game script so they were running an offense that was very 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 fast paced and I expect that to continue because that was under Jason Garrett so with Mike McCarthy who already kind of has an up-tempo offense I would expect very much the same one more interesting note I think we should add in is Mike McCarthy said at the combine he spent this year looking at offensive trends and he mentions that two running back sets are starting to re-emerge and work so that was interesting because we have this guy Tony Pollard who a lot of people like now on the outside it's very hard to objectively get excited about Tony Pollard because at the end of the day he is a second string running back behind one of the highest workhorse running backs in the NFL right now. So no matter which way you twist it, it's hard to envision Tony Pollard being a full-time player. However, we've seen Mike McCarthy use a guy like Randall Cobb very interestingly, right? On the outside, in the slot, even taking a lot of handoffs from the backfield. So I think there's a very realistic path to see Tony Pollard not line up as a pure running back, but to get, you know, 10 touches a game. He could be in that 160 to 170 touch range. If that's the case, I mean, he could definitely return RB2 value this year. I'm not someone who's going to jump up and like get super excited just because, again, objectively, he's the second string running back behind the most used running back in the NFL. But it's interesting to hear that from Mike McCarthy, knowing that he's probably already thinking ahead about a guy like Tony Pollard. So overall, Mike McCarthy, I really like the move for fantasy. I think Zeke still has an absolutely elite floor, right? Like we saw on the consistency chart video last week, zero, 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 zero bus games, which I expect to pretty much be the case again in 2020. I'm just not that high on his ceiling because when you look at the other elite running backs you can draft in fantasy, Saquon, C-Mac, Dalvin Cook, all of them are elite pass catchers and all of them are extremely involved in the passing game on their teams. So I don't know. I, I, it's very possible that we do get that from Zeke in, in 2020, but I don't know if we're going to get that just based on the history of Mike McCarthy's offenses. Yes, y'all are going to be like, but he never had a running back like Zeke or whatever. He's had plenty of good pass catchers and only three 50 target seasons for running back. So that's what concerns me. So Zeke is probably my 104. I'm also curious to know where you guys have him. I'm assuming all you guys have him among that elite group of running backs. I want to know how high. If we're talking half PPR, where do you have Zeke ranked? Drop that comment down below. We have run through a lot of new coaches. We have plenty more to go. So this episode is going to be a long one. I hope you all are enjoying. Again, if you are, just hit that thumbs up button below or leave a rating review on iTunes. We clearly go in depth here at the the HQ, right? I want to give you guys the best information, the best value, which is why every offseason we put together the Big Dogs Gotta Eat draft guide. It's literally everything that you need for your fantasy football season to prep for it. It's all these videos that we do weekly. We put out so many pieces of content. So what we do is we create this draft kit for you to organize our absolutely best 
elite exclusive content for y'all. So we're working very hard behind the scenes on it. Again, it's literally the only thing you're going to need for your season long draft. But this year, we've also created the Rookie Dynasty Guide, which we are working on right now, which will launch on April 1st. And thanks in huge part to MonkeyKnifeFight.com, who is sponsoring the draft guide this year. Y'all are literally going to get both kits for $10. We sold the combo of draft kits for 50 bucks last year. You're going to be able to play on Monkey Knife Fight with 10 bucks plus 100% deposit match bonus, so 20 bucks, and get the draft guides for free. So you're getting like an $80 value for $10 right now, which is absolutely incredible. Literally, all you got to do is go over to BigDogsDraftGuide.com slash mkf all the directions and instructions on how to get the draft guides for ten dollars is on that page big dog draft guide.com slash mkf literally everything you need for your rookie draft your dynasty startup draft your season long draft it's all there you are getting all the information for ten dollars you don't even have to watch another video i do over the summer because all the best shit will be in there i love you let's talk about the denver broncos denver broncos bring in pat Shermer as their offensive coordinator formerly the head coach of the new york giants again this is one of those situations where an offensive coordinator is really good at what they do because they only focus on that one thing then they move over to being the head coach and they fail miserably because there are a thousand other wrenches thrown into the equation and they can't handle it. Then they go back to being the coordinator and they're really good at their job again. I think that's what we're going to see here with Pat Shermer and we've seen it time and time again with the NFL. So I like this move for Denver because Vic Fangio is the head coach. They are going to be running Pat Shermer's offense. So I'm excited to see how this works out with Drew Locke because Pat Shermer has been very, very good at developing quarterbacks and bringing out the best statistical seasons of these quarterbacks like dating I have a list here dating back to McNabb in Philly 02 to 08 even when he worked with like a bunch of shitty quarterbacks he brought out the best in them he worked with Bradford in uh in St. Louis in 2010 that was the year that he won offensive rookie of the year you have Colt McCoy and Brandon Whedon in Cleveland both of them had their best statistical seasons under Shermer Case Keenum in Minnesota had his best statistical year under Shermer then you have Eli in 2018 who obviously had fallen off but even at that rate under Shermer he had a career high in completion percentage 4300 passing yards 21 to 11 touchdown interception ratio and then we had Daniel Jones last year who had a very big statistical seasons by all intents and purposes for a rookie so Pat Shermer's resume in terms of being able to bring out the best in quarterbacks is is very well noted and I think he'll be able to do a good job with Drew Locke Shermer's offense for the most part is is about being aggressive it's about being downfield and that was absolutely not the case last year for Drew Locke so Drew Locke attempted a deep pass on just 7.1 percent of his throws which was the second lowest rate among 39 qualified quarterbacks last year. Now, when we look at the Giants, there are only five teams in the entire NFL that recorded more plays of 20 yards or more than the Giants have over the last two seasons under Shermer. There was an article, uh, an absurd fucking article on DenverBroncos.com, which was basically like the equivalent of that David Montgomery graphic where they just compared him to all the GOAT running backs in the NFL. And they're like, he's a mashup of this. In the article, they say, Shermer's system incorporates the West Coast elements of Andy Reid's offense with the vertical passing game of Norv Turner's offense and the hurry up elements of Chip Kelly's offense. So they basically David Montgomery, Pat Shermer. But that's just the, the you know the style that he runs is supposed to be up tempo. It's supposed to be downfield and aggressive. So just to give you an idea of what the Denver Broncos offense could be like, I'd imagine a lot of personnel turnover in Denver this year through free agency and through the NFL draft. They have absolutely nothing behind Cortland Sutton at wide receiver. Do they look for another outside guy and maybe move Sutton into the slot more, like we saw Shermer do with Adam Thielen in Minnesota? Would love to see more deep shots to Cortland Sutton down the field, man. This guy is so much fun to watch when the ball is in the air. And you look at the numbers, right? In 2019, he had... 427 yards on deep targets that ranked sixth in the NFL. That was while seeing the 19th most deep targets in the NFL. So 19th most deep targets, but six most deep yards. He was ridiculously efficient on those deep targets. And when you look at him moving, we talk about him moving into the slot, possibly uh, when he was in the slot last year, he was really good too, right? He only ran from the slot on 18.5% of his snaps. However, he had a 25.3% target share running from the slot compared to 21 and a half percent target rate on non slot snaps. And he caught all 16 of the catchable passes that were thrown his way from the slot ranked sixth among 87 qualified wide receivers in terms of yards per route run from the slot, which we know is one of the more predictive statistics for wide receivers. I love this for Sutton. We'll have to see what they do in the draft because again, they have nothing at wide receiver. In terms of the running backs, Royce Freeman has been fucking terrible. He was really bad last year. I'd be very surprised if they didn't shake up the backfield. And now we're seeing reports emerge that they're looking to compliment Philip Lindsay with someone else. Like Royce Freeman just ain't it, apparently. For now, Lindsay is pretty much a, a back-end RB2, and he's really not been good in the passing game. He's almost hit 50 targets in each of his first two seasons. He hasn't eclipsed it yet, but he's been right around there. 
And in that time, he's ranked 24th and 39th in yards per route run among qualified running backs. And Royce Freeman has been even worse. So neither of them have been good in the passing game. Lindsey is an awesome runner, though. Definitely continues to deserve, you know, 175 to 200 carries a season, if not maybe even more than that. But his involvement in the passing game needs to start coming down. And I think they will draft a running back that is uh, is versatile and can be used in the running game to complement Philip Lindsey as an early down runner, maybe take more of the short line word, uh, work and then someone who's very efficient in the passing game. So I think they'll shake things up there. And if you want to talk about the opposite of exciting, we can talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars. They hired Jay Gruden as their offensive coordinator, former head coach of Washington. He had spent the last six years in Washington, was the Cincinnati offensive coordinator in the three years prior. The biggest question mark for me is what happens to Leonard Fournette. Not really a question mark, for me, but for the fantasy season, because last year, the receiving numbers were absolutely out of control, right? 100 targets, 76 receptions, 522 receiving yards. The receiving targets, receptions, and yardage were more in 2019 than the entire total combination of 2017 and 2018 together. Again, Gruden is one of those guys who were good as an offensive coordinator, bad as a head coach, and I think he'll be good again as an offensive coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars. When you look at his history, right, you're seeing an improving offense basically throughout his entire time. The first year he takes over in Cincinnati, they're an okay offense. The next year he improves upon that. The next year he improves upon that. 20.8 points per game, 23.8 points per game, 25.9 points per game. You see the same thing as soon as he took over in Washington, right? 18.8 points per game. Next year, 23.9. The next year, 24.8. And then they just had problems with their quarterback situation. So I'm not really going to put that on him. But you're seeing this consistent theme. He takes over, works with the offense. They get better and better and better as the years go on. There's a lot of things that make me nervous about Leonard Fournette going into this year under Jay Gruden. One, I just think he's a pretty trash running back altogether. I don't think he's talented. I don't think he's elusive. I don't think he creates for himself. As you can see from the chart above, Gruden has served as an offensive coordinator or a head coach in nine separate seasons. Not once did he have a rushing offense in the top half of the league. Never did he have a rushing offense rank in the top 16, which is not great for Fournette. But back to those 100 targets, he's not sniffing that in 2020. The highest number of targets a running back has gotten in the entirety of Jay Gruden's tenure as an OC or head coach was Gio Bernard back in 2013. He saw 71 targets. Otherwise, the leading running back target guy in a Jay Gruden-led offense, 58, 55, 54, 62, 48, 47, 30, and 31. So for the most part, he's between 40 and 60. Nowhere near that 100 target mark. Can Fournette still see 300 plus touches? Absolutely. But as per usual with him, you don't expect them to be efficient. He's not been an efficient runner. Jay Gruden's offenses are never efficient on the ground, and their offensive line is trash. 25th per run blocking PFF, 27th per football outsiders. It's just a horrible situation for Fournette to succeed in. I do like it for the passing game. On the flip side, we're going to see a quarter quarterback battle between Foles and Minshew. We never got to see Gruden operate with an alpha in Washington, right? The best targets he ever really got to work with were like Pierre Garçon, uh, a little bit of Deshaun Jackson, and Jordan Reed. But if we go back to his days in Cincinnati as an offense coordinator, we have A.J. Green. Now, there's a guy on Jacksonville who has a very similar build, stature, game type, speed, getting the ball up in the air as A.J. Green. Goes by the name of DJ Chark. Now, AJ Green had, it was his first three years in the league where his three years under Jay Gruden as the offense coordinator. So it matched up perfectly. And those were probably his best three years and probably three of his four best years in the NFL. AJ Green was an absolute alpha seeing ridiculous target numbers. So if we hear some stuff throughout the summer of Jay Gruden comparing DJ Chark to AJ Green and maybe using him similarly, that would be fucking fantastic. And I would love that. So they are a very high volume passing offense. They're going to continue to pass at a high efficiency. It might take a year really for them to install that offense as we've seen with the other stops for Jay Gruden. The first year is okay. Second year gets much better. Third year gets even better. So I'm not going to be buying into anyone in this Jacksonville offense other than DJ Chark with expectations being lowered. 2021 might be the year to invest. Uh, we'll see what they do in the draft, but I like this from a passing offense. They do need to shore up their offensive line, of course, but I will be staying far away from Uncle Lenny in redraft leagues this year. We'll move all the way over to the West Coast. We have both Los Angeles teams making changes on the offensive coordinator side of things. The Chargers went ahead and made Shane Steichen the uh, full-time offensive coordinator. He was the quarterback's coach. He did take over as the offensive offense coordinator like halfway through last year, and he actually took over play-calling duty. So we could take a look at quickly some things that we can maybe take away from. One through eight was when he was not calling the plays. He was still the quarterback's coach. So you see the passing rate was high. You see the target rate to the running backs was high. Y'all can look at it for yourself. What I wanted to see was like, how is this going to affect Austin Eckler? Or how is this going to affect the running backs? Because we know in LA that they use the running backs at such a high rate in the passing game. Now, if he took over... Some 
started calling the plays and we saw that dip, that would be a little bit of a red flag for me, but that was not the case whatsoever. We saw the target rate to running backs actually go up from 29 all the way up to 35%. The pass rate overall went down, but there are, I mean, listen, this is a very small sample size. It's half of one year, and there were a lot of moving parts in Los Angeles last year in terms of the Melvin Gordon holdout, in terms of his Hunter Henry's injury. So we can't really attribute much to that. So I'm not going to look too deep into it, but as we could just see from the chart, I'm not worried about Austin Eckler. The overall RB1 for fantasy next year, 2020 market down. The Los Angeles Rams, uh, they hired Kevin O'Connell as their offensive coordinator, who was the former OC of Washington. This is still very much McVay's offense, so we're not going to dive into that at all. Miami Dolphins hired Chan Gailey as the offensive coordinator. Last time he was in the NFL was as an offensive coordinator for the Jets in 2016. So this is a very interesting hire, an old ass guy that hasn't been in the league for a few years. He utilizes a spread offense. He does lots of three wide receiver, one running back, one tight end sets. Also has the connection with Ryan Fitzpatrick. He was in New York from 2015 to 2016 when Fitzpatrick was there. And Fitz actually set career highs in 2015 under Chan Gailey. So that is interesting. And the two also spent time in Buffalo together, 2010 to 2012. I like this for Devontae Parker, running a lot of spread sets running a lot of high volume like passing the offenses that Changeli runs typically never run through the tight end but you're seeing more reports of Mike Kosicki is going to be playing the big slot role for this offense which you like to hear but when you actually dive into the numbers Kosicki actually led all tight ends last year in the NFL in terms of the percentage of his snaps that came from the slot so he was already running 72 percent of his routes from the slot last year so I can't imagine that number being that much higher he was already there. People are going to hear that. Oh, he's going to be the big slot. This is awesome for him. But he was basically already that last year and was okay. His yards per out run, 1.02, were 21st among 35 qualified tight ends. So you could peg Gesicki for a breakout, but I'm going to probably pull the reins back depending on the health of the offense, right? Do they draft one or two wide receivers in the draft? Is Preston Williams healthy? Do they have a pass catching running back this time of year? Is Albert Wilson healthy? There are a lot of things that I think contributed to Mike Kosicki's like mini breakout last year, and most of them had to do with health of the other wide receivers on the team. So I'm a little bit less bullish on Mike Kosicki breaking out this year than mo most people will, just because they're only going to see that one report, that one blurb of him playing the big slot role. But y'all now know that he was already playing the big slot role last year. The fake news will be televised. Minnesota Vikings hired Gary Kubak as the offense coordinator. He was already kind of like the former assistant head coach of Minnesota last year. So nothing's really going to change still going to be an extremely run-friendly offense. I don't expect really anything to change with Dalvin Cook and the pass catchers. He was already a big part of their offense and their success last year, so nothing really to touch on here. Now, we have two more teams to dive a little bit more in depth on. Those are two teams out of the NFC East. We have New York, the G-Men, and the Washington Redskins. So by now, y'all know that the Giants went ahead and hired Joe Judge, former special teams and wide receivers coach for the Patriots, and, uh, and then Jason Garrett. Gotta love that. Gotta love that from at least an entertainment standpoint for all the Giants fans that absolutely hate Garrett. Another guy who fits into that mold of uh, being an offense coordinator, then becoming a head coach, and going back to OCing. So I, again, like this more for Jason Garrett now that he's an OC again and not a head coach. Joe Judge, uh, I'm not really going to dive into Joe Judge because he is not going to be calling the plays. This offense is not going to be dictated by him. So let's kind of dive into Jason Garrett. Now, Garrett actually did not call the plays in Dallas for the last like six or seven years. Last time he called plays was back in 2012. So 2007 to 2012, when he was the OC, he did call the plays. And during that time, Garrett's offenses finished lower than 11th in yards per play or yards per game just once so very efficient offenses and we've seen the Dallas Cowboys have efficient offenses during his time as a head coach even though he wasn't calling the plays Kellen Moore was the play call caller in 2019 like I kind of went over with Mike McCarthy and I think that's why we saw so much success from Dak this was career years as soon as Kellen Moore came in and ran that up-tempo fast-paced offense we saw Dak kind of blow up and he never did that under Jason Garrett now what he did was he added a lot of pre-snap motion he added a lot of bunch formations a lot more play action which was uh, great to see for that offense but was was it Jason Garrett doing that or was it Kellen Moore? Probably Kellen Moore. But will Jason Garrett take what we saw being so successful in Dallas and transfer that over to the New York football giants? It's hard to grasp that, but we will see. For Saquon Barkley, you have to absolutely fucking love this because Jason Garrett always used a workhorse running back. Anytime there was anything resembling a workhorse in that Dallas backfield, he was getting an absurd amount of touches. You just look at the history. Zeke, touches per game, 22.2, 25.4, 26.8, 23.7. The year before that, it was a mix of McFadden and Randall, but whoever was the featured back for that 
game, got around 20 touches. DeMarco Murray, we know he had that ridiculous year in 2014, 28 touches, 19 the year before that. Murray splitting with Felix Jones, whoever was the starting running back for those games, got over like 20 touches a game. So Saquon Barkley is going to absolutely fucking eat. And Jason Garrett, this is probably notable, brought over Mark Colombo, who was the offensive line coach for Dallas under Garrett since 2015. So I really like that. You're bringing a little bit of continuity. We've also seen the O-line in Dallas just be elite for the last like six years, eight years, whatever the fuck it's been at this point. We should see good things with this Giants offensive line and, and improving and improving. And I'm a really big fan of this move for Evan Ingram if he doesn't get traded. So we're seeing reports that the Giants don't believe he could stay healthy. So if he does get moved, this obviously becomes irrelevant. But if he doesn't, then you have to like it just because we saw a guy like Jason Witten, who is much less athletic than Evan Ingram, be really successful during his time in Dallas. So if Evan Ingram can do the things Jason Witten did, plus add that explosion and downfield part of the game to it, I absolutely love this. But as I mentioned before with Jay Gruden, a lot of the times when a new offensive coordinator takes over the offense, it takes a year for them to really implement and see the actual success and see the everything come to fruition. We saw that with Kyle Shanahan in Atlanta, and we saw it again in, in San Francisco as well. I'm a little bit hesitant to draft anyone on New York outside of those like premier pass catchers. I'll have some Evan Ingram if he stays. I will. I love this for Barkley, obviously. As I already mentioned, he's going to get a ton of touches. But those guys that are like borderline, yes, you might get excited about them. You know, the Golden Tates, the Darius Slaytons, even Sterling Shepherds. I will stay away. Again, I think this is probably more of like a 2021 thing that I'll like. Like I'll, I'll stay away from Darius Slayton this year because I think it'll take a year to implement the offense. And then next year when he's like kind of like a buy low in Dynasty, that's when I'll probably jump back in. In terms of Daniel Jones, I'm still going to look at him as a later option. I think that like rushing floor, the rushing side of the game is going to be there no matter who the offensive coordinator or head coach is. That's just any kind of athlete that's a quarterback is always going to have that part of their game installed. One thing I'd love to see more of is play action for Daniel Jones. Last year, only 18% of his passes came via play action, which ranked 29th among 32 quarterbacks. But his completion percentage was 4% higher on play action passes as compared to regular. And his yards per attempt were nearly two and a half yards per attempt more with play action passes than non-play action passes. And that delta, the two and a half difference, was the seventh highest among all quarterbacks in the NFL last year. So he's obviously way more successful doing play action passes than regular passes. And I bring it up because while DJ was only at 18% of his plays being play action, Dak was throwing via play action at a 25% clip. So at a much higher rate, it's one of the easiest ways, as I mentioned with Stefanski to get easier passes for your quarterback, get guys more open, get the defenses on their heels and not being able to know like what's really going on with the passing offense. So if DJ can get more easy throws, he'll be a much more efficient quarterback, probably leading to a lot less turnovers. But again, was it Kellen Moore who did that? Very hard to say since we haven't seen Jason Garrett call plays since back in 2012. And I guess if we look at those numbers, I'm sure he's, he's adapted as a play caller since then. But Tony Romo was the quarterback that year, back in 2012. They threw via play action on just 10% of their throws that year, which was the single lowest rate among any quarterbacks in the league. So that could be a big yikes. But again, that was like eight years ago. So hopefully they've adapted and we see more play action via Daniel Jones this year. Last but certainly not least is Riverboat Ron going to the Washington Redskins. Former coach of the Panthers, of course. He brings over Scott Turner, the offensive coordinator for the Panthers, to offensive coordinate offensively coordinate for the Washington Redskins I love Ron man I feel like he just got really unlucky the last few years with injuries which have led to a poor team performance overall but I feel like if, if things clicked one more time he would be back in that like upper echelon of head coaches again like if Cam got healthy this year and everyone else didn't like die on the Panthers he would be considered a very good coach not that he's not considered a good coach but the Redskins got a fantastic fucking coach in Ron Rivera he seems to be really high on Dwayne Haskins like he every time you hear him talk about him he genuinely feels like there's a lot of potential with Haskins do they end up with Tua on their team they're number two overall in the NFL draft this year so most people assume they're going to take Chase Young the D end out of Ohio state but who knows man you never know at the nfl draft if they end up taking tua then obviously you know haskins is out of the picture it's possible like after seeing what arizona did last year and that came away extremely successful right using a first round pick on josh rosen two years earlier then the next year they take kyla murray one overall and that obviously worked out so NFL teams might be a little more open to uh, admitting that they were wrong early on, which is not going to be the case in Washington because their owner is a piece of shit and he probably has way too much ego to admit he was wrong, but that's beside the case. So they bring over Ron Rivera's offense. They bring over Scott Turner's offense from Carolina and they did re-sign Adrian Peterson. They have Bryce Love coming back from injury. So as much as I love Darius Geis and I've talked about how I really, really like him this year because he's two years removed from the ACL and we always draft players two years removed from the ACL, not eight months off the ACL. I do think this will be a little bit of a running back by committee, unfortunately. I know that they use Christian McCaffrey as a workhorse, but 
Ron Rivera has came out and said this multiple times. He's like, I've always tried to mix in multiple running backs. I like using a running back by committee until we came across Christian McCaffrey. And even in his rookie season, Christian McCaffrey shared the workload with Jonathan Stewart. I think until like he proved he was really an elite running back, Ron Rivera was hesitant to do that. So I do think we're going to see a bit of a running back by committee for Geis. So I'm a little bit scared to draft him early on where I originally had plans to, you know, think about targeting him. So we'll pull back on that. Terry McLaurin, I just absolutely fucking love. I think that this young group of offensive players is really exciting in Washington. Between Geis, between Bryce Love, Terry McLaurin, even like Kelvin Harmon getting on the field. This is going to be interesting. I think this is just a great hire for Washington because they obviously need a culture change. They've had so much fucking turmoil in their franchise for the last bunch of years between, you know, Jay Gruden and the ownership and the front office just like never agreeing on shit, especially in the quarterback situation. So it'll be interesting to see if they do end up with Tua on their team or they stick with Haskins. But like they just needed a culture change. And I think Ron Vera is absolutely the right guy to be able to implement that and kind of change the entire franchise and the culture around there. So I love this for a fantasy standpoint. Does it come to fruition in year one? We'll have to see. But long term, it's absolutely going to be a great move for the Redskins. And they got a great hire there. Love Terry. He's probably the only guy you could really draft with any sort of confidence here. Geis is probably a later-ish pick, maybe like fifth, sixth, seventh round still, just because I do think it's going to be running back by committee. And obviously his injury history is well documented at this point. So, oh boy, that is all I got for y'all today. I don't know why I say that's all I got for you because I just went on for so fucking long. This file, let me see how long this bitch has been running. An hour and 11 minutes. This file is over 60 gigabytes. God damn. My teeth look white as fuck. Okay, okay. I really hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you got a lot of information and a lot of valuable information from it. If you did, all I ask is that you hit that thumbs up button down below. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe because we're hitting you with the big facts all off season. And again, y'all can go Go grab both. The Rookie Dynasty Guide goes live April 1st, so that's in a few weeks. And you'll get the season-long guide for $10. BigDogDraftGuide.com slash MKF. I love y'all. I'm out.